go. And I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see this okay? Yes. All righty. Well, welcome everybody to today's brown bag lunch presentation and discussion. Uh, it's going to be a cool one today. Uh, we're going to begin with a we land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that Cal Poly Humboldt is on the land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Arcata is known as Gudini, meaning over in the redwoods or among the redwoods. Wiat peoples continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. And here at Ollie, we believe that learning should never end. This is a cool picture that we took from one of our live classes, our in-person tour classes at the Trinidad Lighthouse. Uh, and that was really, really cool. Um, so just a heads up, uh, we are trying to get more membership, trying to get more people to join Ollie. Uh, as you know, during the pandemic, we kind of dropped off a little bit. Uh, a lot of people, uh, didn't know what to do when in-person stuff stopped happening. So as we slowly started to incorporate more online classes, people started to join more. And now that we're integrating to basically almost half online, half in-person, uh, we're really trying to encourage people to uh, become Ollie members. And there's a couple reasons why you should be an Ollie member. Um, first of all, benefits, uh, they're $35 a year for people 50 and better. And the membership uh, era is July 1st through June 30th, and membership must be renewed each year for students to remain active. Um, but some of the specific reasons why being an OLLI member would be beneficial. Uh, you get lower class fees and first priority registration. Uh, you get a Cal Poly Humble email account and a .edu email gives you so many benefits that I'm still discovering more as time goes on, discounts to online services, so on and so forth. Um, you get a discount on the Jack Pass, uh, which is a local transportation uh, pass. It's $60 with enrollment in a fee-based class. You get eligibility, eligibility for course scholarships, uh, student discounts at local businesses. Uh, members can participate in the Ollie special interest groups. Uh, you get full library access, the same as a full-time Cal Poly Humble student would with your student ID card. And getting a student ID card is super, super easy. If there's just a form you fill out online. Uh, and then for fall, spring, and summer semester, uh, the rec center is open for all the members. It's $73 per semester or $28 for a month or $10 each day. But just make sure that you're enrolled in something and that you have your student ID. And Ollie members can also participate in Let's Connect Ollie online conversations. This kind of started during the pandemic as a way for people to stay connected, talk about different, uh, you know, topics. Um, and it's uh, hosted, facilitated by Tracy Barnes Priestley. Uh, it's an hour long and it focuses on a new topic every week. Uh, so if you're interested, check out that website. It's uh, extended.humble.edu slash Ollie slash Let's Connect. Uh, it's definitely something to look worth. It's something to look into. Um, and it's, it's almost there. We're almost at Saturday, February 11th, which is our Ollie open house. Uh, you get to explore the upcoming spring classes. You get to meet Ollie staff. You get to meet the volunteers and you get to meet the instructors. And it's also a great way to on the spot, join Ollie or renew your membership or just get whatever kind of other information that you need. And that's going to be uh, at the D Street Neighborhood Center, 1301 D Street Arcata, 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, and on the day of, we're going to have a bunch of signs to point exactly where you need to go. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, and just another heads up, spring classes begin early March. This spring, Ollie has impressive lineup of classes. We have more than 30 in-person classes and 40 online classes. Uh, and all of these classes are now available to look up on the Ollie website and our catalog, which should be coming out uh, via mail very, 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 very soon. And you can go online 
and look at it at humboldt.edu slash ollie and you can see what's coming up I'll put and the register. I'll put the links to those uh, to that online catalog in the chat uh, after I'm done introducing everything. Uh, and we just wanted to say thank you to the friends of Ollie. Um, most of our programs uh, features, uh, including our brow bag presentations and less connect groups, they wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you for your wonderful support. Uh, and also thank you to the volunteers of Ollie. Uh, they help in so many different areas of all of our planning, uh, just enriching the experience of everybody. Um, so we appreciate your wonderful support as well. And without further ado, we are going to start the wonderful world of cacti with Ryan Archambault. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm going to turn it over to Jane, who's going to introduce him for us. And welcome to all of you today. Uh, Ryan grew up in Los Angeles, where he fell in love with cacti at a young age, gardening with his mother. He attended school at the California Institute of the Arts, where he graduated with a bachelor's in fine arts, but is completely self-taught in botany. We're looking forward to seeing the pictures and getting the information he has to share with us today about cacti. It's all yours, Brian. Ryan. Hi, how's it going, everyone? Um, I am a cacti enthusiast. I'm not a uh, professional by any means. <laughs> But um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, it became kind of an obsession of mine. And um, like uh, Jane said, I've, I've kind of uh, been interested in cacti since uh, I was young. Um, I'd go to the nursery with my mom and she'd let me pick out plants and I'd always uh, pick out some type of cacti. Um, they've just always kind of interested me. Um, so anyway, I'll start the uh, slideshow. Let's see here, here we go. Cool. Can everyone see that? Okay, so um, if there's any questions, feel free to um, type in the chat. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to see it, so maybe someone just yell at me. Ryan, will you you can uh, ask people to raise their hands if you can see that, or we will let you know if there's something in the chat. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so yeah, this is the wonderful world of cacti. <laughs> um, to start off, um, I kind of want to explain what a cactus is. Uh, sometimes there's a little confusion. Um, so a cactus is a member of the plant family Cactaceae, which uh, is a family com comprising of um, 127 uh, genera genera with some uh, 1,750 known species in the order Caryophyllales, which is um, kind of like a succulent uh, order. Um, there's like a lot, mostly um, succulents and, and fleshy stems, fleshy leaf kind of plants. Um, all cacti are angiosperms, which means that they all produce flowers. Um, cacti, there's some speculation about the evolution of cacti when they, when they kind of originated. Um, some say 30 million years ago, some say 50 million years ago, it's really hard to find any cacti fossils because um, they're mostly uh, comprised of water, so um, they don't really hold up too well as a, a fossil. Um, so for now, I'm going to just say that they kind of came around uh, about 50 million years ago um, in um, South America, uh, once the Andes kind of rose and kind of cut the cut the ocean off from the um, mainland, um, it kind of created like a hostile desert environment. Um, some of the earliest cacti are, um, uh, they were kind of like trees with, with spines on them. Um, and they evolved into all different shapes and sizes, which I'm gonna get into a little later. Um, although some species live in quite humid environments, most cacti live in habitats um, subject to at least some drought. Many live in extremely dry environments. Um, all cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. Cacti are native to the Americas, uh, ranging from Patagonia in the south to parts of Western Canada in the north, um, except for Rifsalis uh, bassifera, which also grows in Africa and Sri Lanka. So if you see the blue and the green there, um, pretty much all of the cacti that you 
typical cacti that you would think of um, are all South and North America. And then those cacti, like the Christmas cacti and the, the ones that kind of hang that are more epiphytes, um, those are from the more like tropical uh, areas. Um, cacti have uh, many adaptations to conserve water. Um, the stems are ribbed or fluted, which allows them to expand and contract easily for quick water absorption after a rain. Um, and then they're able to retain that water for really long periods of time. Um, most species of cacti have lost uh, their true leaves um, and only spines have remained, uh, which are highly modified leaves, um, as well as defending against herbivores Spines help prevent water loss by reducing airflow in between the spines and um, provide some shade. Um, there's many cacti that produce really uh, dense white spines, you know, kind of reflects the harsh um, desert suns. Um, some cacti pr uh, prefer some shade. Um, some live under uh, bushes and stuff like that. If you uh, like Lophophora or the um, Astrophytums kind of prefer a little bit of shade. Um, yeah, so their stems are their primary source of photosynthesizing since they don't have any leaves. And uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. And then you, there's also some examples here of um, these spines. I thought it was kind of a cool photo. Um, there's many different types of spines. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, cho the choya, but um, they have a barbed spine. So when they stick into you, um, really hard to take them out. Uh, those are those are called like the jumping choya down in, uh, you, you find them down in um, Southern California, Joshua tree, that kind of thing. Um, but they are, they are kind of everywhere also. Um, this is the aerial. Um, uh, cactus spines are produced from specialized structures called aerials, a kind of highly reduced branch. Um, aerials are an identifying feature of cacti. So, um, for example, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the euphorbia. Um, they're mostly from Africa. Well, they're, they're all over, but um, a lot of the the heavy hitters are from Africa. But um, <clears throat> so you'll 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 see one that. They have like a very convergent evolution where they have grown these big columnar type of uh, like um, cactus looking plant with a bunch of spines on them. If they don't have aerials and they're not a cactus, they're, you know, in some other uh, family. So most likely euphorb euphorbiaceae, euphorbiaceae, I think that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, um, as well as spines, aerials give rise to flowers, which are usually tubular and multi-petaled. Um, usually pollinated by birds, insects, and bats. So um, you have like moths. And a lot of these flowers are uh, nocturnal as well. Um, many cacti have short growing seasons and long dormancies and are able to react quickly to any rainfall, helping by extensive but relatively shallow root systems that quickly absorb any water reaching the surface. Um, unlike, uh, Plants, um, cacti photosynthesize through um, crassulation acid metabolism, which is, um, as you can see on the, on the picture on the right, that's a stomata of a cactus. Um, and basically during the day, the stomata closes. Here, I'll just read my little, my little thing here. Um, like other uh, succulent plants, most cacti employ a special mechanism called crassulation acid metabolism, AKA CAM. As part of photosynthesis, um, transpiration during carbon dioxide in, enters the plant and water escapes. This is, it doesn't take place during the day at the same time as photosynthesis, but instead occurs at night. The plant stores the carbon dioxide it takes in as malic acid, retaining it until daylight returns, and only then using it in photosynthesis. Because transpiration takes place during the cooler, more humid uh, night hours, water loss is significantly reduced. So yeah, it's basically, um, kind of like sweating only at night, you know, after a really hot day. <laughs> um, so I wanted to show you some different types. This is, you know, my favorite thing about cacti is um, just how many different types there are. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to like collect them all, you know, they're like, I don't know, 
they're super cool to me. Um, so on the left here, there's a saguaro that's kind of like what everyone thinks of a cacti. When I say like cacti, everyone's like, oh, the ones with the arms, you know? Um, the one here in the middle is the uh, world's smallest cacti, the world's smallest known cacti, uh, the Blasphildia lilipuntiana. And those grow among um, a lot of waterfalls. So they kind of like a little mist in the air. Um, and then on the right here is a uh, Astrophytum caput medusia, which was um, recently discovered, I think in 2012, I wanna say. Um, and then it was put in the family um, Astrophytum, which is super weird because Astrophytums are usually this kind of a bulb, not a bulb, what's a, like a ball kind of looking um, cacti. But that's, yeah, so uh, the Astrophytum caput medusia also has a, like a tuber kind of root. So you can kind of grow them, grow them like codex plants, which are, you can raise them out of the soil. There'd be like a big kind of ball. And then it has like all these little tentacles poking out. I think it's such a cool plant. Um, let's see here. So here we go. Yeah, so this is um, Hagioceros uh, ten tenuous, which is um, grows in, in Peru uh, along the coast for a very short or small amount of, um, I think it's like 5,000 kilometers um growing like mostly just in sand um i actually just recently read an article about these um they reproduce uh via um what's the word i want uh oh, man what's the word sorry i'm, I'm a little tired right now <laughs> um oh man basically it's all the same plant um so one will grow and kind of like maybe get cut off or move and then it'll grow somewhere else. And what's the word for that? I don't know if you want to chime in. Oh wait, there's someone in the chat here. Um, okay, cloning, yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so uh, they're pretty much all cloned. And um, the, I think the, like the tree um, stems from, uh, a species called Hegioceros, which is one of my also one of my favorite cacti. Um, but their habitat is getting lost due to um, en encroaching chicken farms. So um, there's a lot of photos of these online. Uh, there's cacti next to like these kind of like arrowhead water bottles and a bunch of chicken feathers all over them and stuff. Um, so there is uh, <clears throat> some effort to try and um, I don't know, conserve them in habitat, or I'm sorry, in, in conservation, just in case. Um, yeah, it's kind of become like this collector's item. And then on the right, there's a Stenocera ceruca in uh, Baja, California, Mexico. The common name is called the creeping devil. And they're, they're called creeping devils because the spines are just really gnarly. Um, but they're, they're both uh, cacti that pro prostrate. Um, so they grow along the ground and as they kind of like travel, the tip of the cactus is alive as the end of it dies. So yeah, it's just kind of like a, I don't know, like a worm that just kind of dies at one end and grows at the other. Um, and it, it roots along the ground as it goes. They're really cool. I, I like that um, that type of growth is really interesting to me. Um, here's another one of my favorites. This is the Astrocylindro puntia lagopus from uh, Puno, Peru. It's the mountains up above. Um, Puno. And um, on the right is the Memularia pl uh, plumosa in uh, Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Um, these are two cacti that are heavily covered in hair. Um, yeah, so the Astrocylindro puntia lagopus actually grows in envir environments that reach freezing temperatures. I can't remember exactly uh, how low it goes. I'm pretty sure, I, I, I was looking at the average temperature there, I think it was like 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I do believe it snows, but I don't want to, I'm like 89% sure it snows there. Um, the one on the right grows in a uh, very arid and bright environments. Um, they both kind of do, I guess, but, um, yeah, so the hairs are an example of how, uh, this plant evolved to, um, reflect some of that harsh, uh, UV ray rays. Um, these are... Melocactus in uh, northern Cuba, they also grow in central Mexico, and a ferrocactus, um, which this one is uh, in central Mexico. And these are barrel types of cacti. The um, ones on the left, the 
cacti, they, um, they, they grow to a certain uh, degree or I don't know, um, they grow, you know, a certain size and then they start to grow the, um, the little hat on top. And um, that's basically like an inflorescence. That's where all the flowers are. That's where the fruits pop out of and their, their fruits look like little chili peppers. Um, yeah, they're super weird. Basically, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but this, these little, uh, these little lines here are um, pretty much the years of growth. Um, these are probably like at least, I don't know, these are old, 50 years old, 30, 30 to 50 years old, I would guess. Um, yeah, these are uh, Apuntias. So um, your Nepales, uh, your prickly pear, those are all Apuntia species, which are the paddle cacti. Um, the one on the left here is uh, Apuntia echios from uh, the Galapagos Island. And, um, and an Apuntia uh, angle manii, um, from Texas. Um, these are pretty much cacti that you will find <clears throat> from uh, South America all the way up through Canada. They're super hardy. They'll grow anywhere. And um, yeah, they, there's, I, I, I didn't like these when I got into cacti because I thought they were boring and they're kind of everywhere. But the more I get into cacti, the more I really like these because they're, the evolution is really weird. And um, there, there was such like a, a um, a use for them among like indigenous nations, you know, in every, like pretty much every culture used them as food or, um, yeah. Uh, actually down in, um, where I'm from in LA, there is a, uh, a little patch of these unidentified species that um, the Chumash used to uh, use as a kind of like a fence to keep um, animals out because the ones that they had down there, their spines were longer. so they kind of made this like little labyrinth to get to this garden that they had. I don't know, they're super cool. These, <clears throat> excuse me, are, uh, this is a Peneoceros uh, gregii in Southwest U United States and a uh, Lepismium uh, in Northwest Argentina. Um, the one on the right is kind of like a epiphyte, grows on trees. Um, you'll find them in like a more humid environment. Uh, that's kind of an example of the Rosalis that's like you'll find in um, Africa, South Southeast Asia, stuff like that. Um, the one on the left, I believe, yeah, Southwest United States, um, they grow also this tuber root um, you can see here in, in B. Um, and they kind of grow like branches. Um, they're really cool. These are uh, highly sought after Copiopoeus cinera um, from Southern Chile. Um, they um, grow along the coast there, and the only water that they get uh, throughout the years is um, coastal fog. So they, they're fog collectors. They're super slow growers. These plants, um, yeah, these plants are like hundreds of years old. Um, only the tips will photosynthesize. So you can see here how this uh, is still alive here. Um, basically, this is dead down here. Um, so yeah, it'll... I don't know. It's super slow growing. Um, there is a problem with these getting poached. Um, and you can tell, well, oh, there's a section later about poaching that I'll get into. But yeah, uh, if you see any of those online, keep, keep away. Um, I wanted to get, talk about transplanting. Um, I gave a lecture to the uh, Eureka um, Gardening Society and um, they asked that I did a little section on transplanting. So um, yeah, I think it's good information. Uh, basically, when I get a, a new cactus, um, I got this one from Eureka Natural Foods, actually. Uh, this is the Lostrelia lilipuntiana, the one that uh, is the smallest species. They're super hard to grow in cultivation, so they're usually grafted on, um, this is a dragon fruit uh, graft. Um, and the, yeah, they're also kind of slow growing. But um, when I got this plant, it was in uh, super um, organic material, which is okay because it's on a dragon fruit. Um, but usually uh, the plants you get at like Home Depot or um, I don't know, kind of like your generic store. Um, I always check for pests. I always check for this like soil type, especially up here. It's so humid that um, I've had a lot of plants just like rot on me. Um, so I always keep my cacti in um, terracotta pots as well because it helps to like expire the water, uh, evaporate the water. Um, so. To transplant, I will remove the plant from the pot and um, kind of break up the soil. Um, sometimes it can get 
like too clamped or uh sorry clamped is not the right word um too cramped i guess and um it won't absorb enough water there needs to be like a uh, flow in there um so i break up the soil um get the roots nice and loose and then i repot it usually in a mixture of um I, I I buy the cactus soil. Uh, you can buy it kind of at any nursery, and then I also buy pumice, uh, usually like medium to small size, and um, I do a fifty fifty mix just to give it some more uh, inorganic material. And um, still alive and doing happy today. Um, for indoor care, I recommend you keep uh, you keep your plants twelve inches or less from south south or east facing windows use or use a grow lamp if you don't have any um any natural light in your in your um in your house uh for watering um cacti are uh um they go dormant for uh more than they grow so um i recommend in the months of may through october um not to not to touch them at all. <laughs> I mean, you could. Uh, I usually sprinkle a little bit of water on them just to keep their roots wet because if they go dry, then they'll just die. And then when it's it's time for them to um, to grow again, then they have to like regrow the roots, which takes takes more more time away from them growing upwards. Um, November through April, I water them once once a week, um, but I definitely check the soil, make sure that it's been completely dried before I add in more more water. Um, best time to water cacti are at dusk because of the um, the way that they photosynthesize. Um, yeah, there's there's many ways to water cacti as well. Um, it really depends on the type of plant, the type of species. Um, some of them, like those ones I showed you, the Mammillaria plumosa with the hairs. I noticed if I water them from up top here in Humboldt, it, they'll just rot because um, the humidity is pretty thick here. Uh, so. <clears throat> something you could do is water around it or you could dip the whole pot in a bucket of water and uh, the water will seep up through the hole and um, yeah it's kind of smarter way to do it as far as outdoor care I added some cacti here that um, will grow grow fine um, out in humble um, obviously dependent dependent on the species uh, but some cold hardy species are the apuntia the uh, echinoceras the coripantha Pedio cactus, and there's quite a few others. Um, they should be kept out of the rain, although um, I've seen a lot of apuntias up here that are growing as big as, you know, a house uh, just out in the open. I'm, I'm experimenting, experimenting with a bunch of cacti right now um, in front of my house. Uh, I've got all types out here, um, and they seem to be doing okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, keep away from freezing temps, although some of them do okay in. Uh... Sorry, that's my. Dog. Um, some of them do okay uh, freezing as well. Propagation techniques. Um, I like to make sure I have a sterile environment, um, get a very, very sharp knife. I usually I actually just used, um, I bought like some new razor blades um, that work best. Um, use rubbing alcohol and um, wipe everything down with rubbing alcohol. I kind of treat cacti like skin, you know. Um, they're pretty prone to infections. Um, so <clears throat> I get a really sharp knife, get some rubbing alcohol, clean the knife off. You can cut it pretty much anywhere. Um, I recommend if you have like a cacti, like a saguaro or whatever, you wanna cut it where the branch, um, maybe that's easier, where the branch is. Um, <clears throat> it's also just like more aesthetically pleasing. Um, but yeah, put it in soil, maybe um, on this cutting here, I'd put this one maybe like up to here. Sorry, my computer's glitching up. Um, and it'll grow roots. I, uh, I usually put my cuttings on heat mats and I keep them under under some grow lights. Um, out here, you could probably just leave them outside and put them in the sun and they should be okay. Um, I wanted to talk about soil and uh, soil mixtures. Um, I think that there is a lot of confusion around uh, growing cacti. Um, so as you'll see, um, cacti grow primarily in inorganic material. So they grow mostly in sand or rocks, um, in between rocks, you know, they, they grow in like very arid, hostile environments. And um, I'm not sure how many of you have been out to the deserts, but they, they are very rocky, very sandy. 
Um, yeah, a lot of them grow in, in places that are rich in limestone or gypsum, which is uh, has kind of become like a evolutionary benefit, you know, advantage because a lot of other plants can't because gypsum is like basically salt and um, it'll just kill many other plants. Um, this is this is Astichium hintonii. Um, they're also also a highly poached plant. They're so their growing environment is is basically vertical, um, and they grow in um, in gypsum as well. Let me see if I've got any more notes here. Oh no! All right. Well, yeah, you can see here the gypsum. Uh, kind of draining or if this is like the water you know uh, it's a very like soft um mineral um these are areocarpuses um the one on the left here is grown in a lime limestone sh uh, shale um as you can see they've kind of evolved these uh tubercle type of um i don't want to call them leaves they're kind of i, I don't know i don't even know what to call it tubercles um uh, to kind of mimic their habitat. Um, these are also highly poached um, plants. Um, the one on the right is growing um, in soil. A lot of these plants too um, ebb and flow with the seasons. Um, so there are like a, a, well, quite a few cacti. Um, since they kind of expand and contract with their water absorption, uh, once they like get enough water, they'll kind of like expand out um, a little bit pop up out of the soil and um, that's kind of like in the winter time and then in the summertime they kind of contract uh, fall back into the soil that's another technique of how they um, can kind of escape the harsh rays too. Oops this is a Echinosteris uh, penelophus that was a pretty flower uh, this is also a Nuevo Leon in limestone Oops, um, this is an Econoceris um, growing in lava rock. These are ferro cacti growing on straight uh, rock cliffs. Um, this is a uh, Epithelantha growing in between these cracks. Um, so yeah, what I use in my, uh, I, I also make like a, a cactus substrate, which is, um, I use decomposed granite, um, zeolite, which is used in um, a lot of aquariums. It's kind of, it absorbs, uh, oh man, blinking. Um, I'll have to come back to <laughs> Calcine clay, which is, which is pretty much clay that's been baked. Um, pine bark to keep some moisture. Uh, azomite is a mineral powder. And uh, mycorrhizae, which is a, um, a fungus that um, grows in, in all soil types. Um, there was a study uh, recently published about um, mycorrhizae in arid environments, and they found um, two, two species of mycorrhizae that live in uh, sand dunes and out in, the, uh, out in the deserts and stuff like that. So um, I, I think it is important um, to give your plants some extra love. Um, here are some signs that your plant is not happy. Um, the one here on the bottom left is uh, super red, which means um, it's sun stressed. Uh, it's getting too much sun, so maybe move it under some shade or put something over it if it's outside. Um, the one in the, in the or I guess second from the left here is uh, etylated, which is a common problem among many people growing cacti. Um, it's, it means that it's deprived of sun. It basically turns into this like vine and it's looking, it's searching for sun anywhere in the room, you know. Um, but the problem with that is once it finds the sun, uh, that little like little stringy guy doesn't get any thicker. Your cactus won't return to normal. It'll start to grow new growth up top here and it'll start uh, growing this way up top, which means that this is just gonna collapse and fall over. So if your cacti is, uh, Etylating like that, I just chop it off. And then once you chop off any part of a cactus down here, it'll pop out. I, I did it to um, uh, one of my friend's cacti and um, pretty much like she had a, 
a columnar cacti that was had a bunch of uh, different heads that were all etylating and I cut them all off and now there's like four to five different you know um little plants coming out of those guys so um uniformly yellow means that it's uh, malnourished and you could add some fertilizer oh here's the chat hold on uh, oh i'm gonna get into poaching um in a minute here there so they're they're poached well I'll, I'll tell you in a minute here <laughs> um but that's a good question um yeah so uh, as far as fertilizer goes um i use pretty much a, a basic one I picked up at um, Ace Hardware, there's a succulent and cacti fertilizer. Um, they're very low in any nutrients, pretty much. Um, I think there's mostly, I think it's mostly phosphorus that that um, is in the fertilizer, but there are some uh, cactus nurseries out there I've talked to that use, um, they use just like a straight up uh, fertilizer that they use on like tomato plants and stuff. They just kind of dilute it. Um, so I don't know, it's kind of fun to um, experiment with that and kind of see how your plants respond. Um, but yeah, shriveling uh, is a loss of water, which is very normal in the dormant season. Um, sometimes I'll freak out and, and be like, oh my God, why is this shrivel shriveled up, you know, but um, it's just, uh, just kind of sleeping, you know. Okay, so here's uh, about poaching. Um, so I'll answer that question, I guess. Why are they poached? Um, they're poached because a lot of these um, cacti sell for a lot of money. They're, um, they've become a collector's items, especially in the last uh, few years. Um, and with the, well, it's, it's kind of like a slippery slope, but a lot of these plants are becoming more and more endangered because of um, human population basically encroaching, uh, building new buildings and, you know, building whatever, uh, parking lots, whatever, you, you know, how humans are. And, um, uh, yeah, so people will just go rip these out of the ground, put them on eBay for uh, huge amounts of money. Um, and a lot of these come from poorer countries. So, you know, a plant like this uh, on the left here that would sell for 350 bucks and go a long way in central Mexico, something like that. Um, it's unfortunate. Same with Chile. Um, it's, it's interesting. A lot, of these, a lot of these plants are actually getting poached to uh, Asia. There's a huge poaching problem in Korea um, and in Ukraine, which is interesting, um, or I guess like Eastern Europe, um, which is pretty horrible because those environments are are not, uh, you know, um, conducive to to proper cac cactus growth. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys were if you heard of the Dudley poachers here that uh, got caught. There was, I mean, it's been happening for a long time, but I think they were. I think they were Korean as well, but those like the Dudley here on the beaches, they'll they'll sell for thousands of money, thousands of dollars. So um, I wanted to point out some signs of poaching. Um, these photos I took from eBay from a random seller. I just typed in Ariocarpus on eBay, and then the one on the left popped up. She had more than one on her site. Um, I actually posted this on Instagram, so they're kind of screenshots from Instagram. But um, so yeah, signs of of uh, of poaching. You can see here on the left. There's a, uh, it's bent up like that, and it's bent up like that because it was growing uh against a rock, or in some type of habitat, you know, where it needed to grow that way. Maybe in between some rocks. Um, another thing too is that it's potted and you can't see its roots, uh, which is a little sketchy. I mean, I sell plants on eBay in pots, um. But I mean, you can tell from the top they're not poached. Um, but yeah, uh, the root system, uh, when they grow in habitat, there's many rocks. There's also like debris in the soil. So the roots will grow around that. And uh, hold on one second, we got chat here. Oh, mealybugs. Mealybugs are horrible. Uh, oops, let me go back here. Mealybugs, um, I spray with rubbing alcohol, just a 70% isopropyl alcohol, and they just melt away. And um, you kind of just have to keep doing that until they, until they, they're gone. But um, I have this one plant here at home that just keeps getting covered in mealybugs, and it's such a pain. But yeah, I just uh, spray a bottle with isopropyl alcohol; it'll just melt them right off. Um, but yeah, uh, as I was saying, um, there are there is a style of growing among um, collectors called called hard growing, 
which is to make it look like it came from habitat or it's grown in habitat. Um, so some people will stage their plants in like these pots and uh, put these rocks around it and then like just have it grow in like these very kind of like brutal way where they're just like, they won't water it. They'll keep it underneath really harsh conditions. Um, and you can kind of tell when someone's doing that because it's still kind of catered. Uh, but here you can see it's, I don't know, it's just kind of thrown in a pot and, and it's been, it's obviously very, um, it's been, it's been ripped out of something. But what I was saying before too, uh, you could check the root system. If the root system looks like it's, it was growing around a rock or like it was growing in between something, like that's another way to tell. Um, same with this um, agave, um, it's all, it's unpotted and um, definitely doesn't look like it was grown in cultivation. Um, and then the, the picture on the on the right here, um, scrolling through their eBay um, store, it was like, it was just like mostly junk stuff like makeup and I don't know, like trolls and charms and Christmas lights and stuff. And then you have like the cacti, $500 cacti, these like agaves that are $300, super out of place. That's a pretty big sign that these were poached as well. Um, so I stole this from the um, Cacti and Secular Society of America. One second. Yeah, I suppose, did you say to dilute it? Nope, just spray Just spray the 70% on, on there. And um, usually when I spray um, a cacti with isopropyl alcohol, I um, will let the alcohol evaporate before I put it back in the sun or anything like that. And, um, and then I usually take like a little toothpick and scrape off all the little uh, mealybug debris um oh sorry anyway um yeah so i stole this from the cacti and succulent society of america um i had a little uh a little brochure they gave me um i kind of wanted to read through some of this um so yeah like i said uh plants show signs of damage um uh yeah bare root um yeah, presence of native soils is pretty important too. You could tell um, a plant was like ripped out of the ground if it's like an iron rich soil, like the, you know, cause like there, no one sells that kind of substrate um, at the cactus or at the at the nursery. No one's, no one's selling limestone or, or you know, super iron rich uh, substrate. It's all, it's all like organic material and pumice. So that's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty good giveaway. Um, Presence of lichen. So um, uh, the are uh, I'm sorry, the copia poa I was showing you um, from Chile that are heavily poached. Um, they grow a lot of lichen because they're super old and they kind of they grow in this um, uh, environment with a lot of fog. Um, also, uh, another indicator that a copia poa is poached is um, since they're out there in the harsh environment for so long, they're they're always um, bombarded with. Um, heavy winds that bring sand and rocks and knock away their, their spines. So you'll see on the growth of a poached um, copiapoa, the, the bottom will be really smooth and the top will have spines. If you grow it in um, cultivation from seed or something like that, the whole cactus will have spines and it, it won't, it won't look all, you know, uh, like it's been through sandpaper storm or something like that. Um, yeah, cacti are usually dehydrated, wrinkled, have broken missing spines. Uh, new growth may appear paler, less uh, glaucous, thinner spines. Um, yeah, so that's what I was saying here, the spineless copiopoa, um, or, or like, yeah, with a dense ring of old spines, exactly. Um, succulents, tap roots and branches are often severely trimmed for easy trans transport, shrubby plants. Um, Apricola carriers are super cool. That's not a, not a cactus. Um, signs of weathering, uh, so lack of spines, um, pachypodiums, sure, another really cool plant. Um, let's see, vendors, yeah, so, um, let's see. Yeah, so sellers out of the blue with a large number of rare or mature plants, delivery, deliberately misspelled names or sell plants via social media. Um, so that last example of this lady that was selling you know, these super, oops, these super expensive plants. Um, and then also just selling like all this other stuff that you kind of find on like the, you know, the ends of eBay. Um, 
Yeah, so that pretty much sums it up. Let me see. Yeah, that's that's it. <clears throat> so um, I, I was starting a, a humble cacti and succulent society up here. Um, it's it's a it'd be like a chapter from the cacti, cactus and succulent society of America. You may also create a mild diluted dish soap solution to remove mealy bugs. Yeah, you could do dish soap and Q-tips. I prefer the isopropyl alcohol because it just melts them away, um, and it just saves a lot a lot of time. And um, I've definitely missed a lot of um, mealy bugs trying to do it, but in that in that method, and then they just kind of come back within the next week or so. But yeah, you could also do that if you have like a if you have a plant that you're a little um, scared of doing that too or whatever. You know, it doesn't hurt to be a little bit more. Um, uh, what's the word? I can't, I really can't think today. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, intentional, I guess is what I'm looking for. Um, so yeah, back to this humble cacti uh, succulent society. Um, I was planning on doing it. It's kind of taken a very slow um, beginning. I, I had some people sign up, but um, kind of fell off the wagon. Um, right now I'm trying to organize a plant show, uh, like a humble humble County plant show. Um, that doesn't have to be, you know, entirely cacti. Um, but I know that there's, I've met a lot of uh, growers out here, not not cannabis, but just um, growers of cacti and just rare, rare, um, unique plants. And I thought it'd be really cool to bring everyone together and kind of share that. Um, I know that there are a lot of uh, plant enthusiasts out in Humboldt and um, yeah, I think it'd be really, really fun. Um, I don't have any info on it yet. It is gonna start in the summer. Um, I'm gonna try and give some flyers out to nurseries and plant, plant stores and and things like that. So keep your eye out. I, I, I do have an Instagram, it's humblecactusco.com. Oh, I also have a cactus store. Uh, it's on H Street. I opened up in May. Um, yeah, come in, check it out. Um, yeah, and that's all I got. I have some questions about Christmas cacti. <clears throat> um, what about, what's the best environment for them? I have one outside on the porch. It gets almost no sun. It's blooming after two years, <laughs> finally. Okay, interesting. Um, and I have two in, several inside. And um, I can get them to bloom by not watering them for a while and then watering them a bunch. Mm -hmm. One of them it has more sun exposure and it gets red is that what is causing that yeah mm -hmm. so it means i need to take it out of the sun yeah maybe give it a little bit more shade um yeah like a lot of growers down in, in southern california and stuff i'm also noticing that up here um let me finish my first thought but in southern california a lot of people grow with um shade cloth so it'll be like a i think it's a 40 to 50 percent shade cloth otherwise it'll just completely burn up um yeah most cacti prefer a little bit of shade um it's it's pretty much like the saguaros that you see that um end up this so saguaros start there's there's kind of uh germinate underneath trees and for you know 50 years they're, they're growing along you know beside a tree in the shade so they don't get like that direct harsh sunlight and then it's not until like they're super old that they they're out, outgrown you know the tree um so yeah, cacti love sun, but uh, sometimes sun is a little harsh. But something I've noticed up here too is um, a lot of plants uh, turn red. A lot of my succulents turn red when they're out in the sun. And um, I don't, this might just be like, uh, I'm making this up, but I have like a theory with the humidity and, and the sunlight and I don't know, maybe. Uh, when they turn red, uh, mine tend to then possibly die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Fall off. laughs> the, uh -huh. the red parts. Mm. So I'm just curious about that. And and if you want to take those pieces that have fallen off and try to transplant them and mm. re-plant them, it, it that works. Does that work or not? Yeah, it depends like how how dead it is. If it is if there's still uh some flesh on it, if it's not completely dehydrated, um that's that's kind of a way that cacti um, propagate themselves in nature too. They'll just drop, you know, and then they'll grow roots, and then they'll grow pups, you know. 
Um, there are some cacti that just do that uh, automatically. But um, back to what was I gonna say? Oh, um, how you were saying that some of your plants are grown in shade and they're blooming some of them, you only water like once and they bloom. Um, that's kind of the thing with these plants, you know, there's 1,750 of them, they grow all the way from like, you know, um, the bottom of South America all the way up to Canada. So there's like super, uh, there's many variations in um, climate and environments and um, some plants uh, like the Lofofora, um, they, they grow in floodplains. So uh, usually like once a year, sometimes once every couple of years, I don't know. Um, a lot of those plants that they grow in will just get flooded and, and they'll be submerged in water for, you know, a day or a few hours or something like that. So uh, a watering technique with them too is you just leave them in a bucket for half an hour, completely submerged in water, you know, but yeah. So there's there's many techniques. I asked the, uh, uh, what's it called? I'm like speaking faster than I'm thinking. Um, oh, the Puna clairavoides. Um, it's this really cool plant. It looks like coral. It grows in the mountains, I think in Peru as well. It's also like, a. it's got a tuber kind of root system. Um, that won't flower unless it, it hits freezing temperatures. So if you keep it like, I don't know, keep it in Southern California in a greenhouse year, year round, you won't see a flower. Um, so I'm experimenting with that here too, because uh, it was freezing. It's been, it's still kind of freezing every night. So I was going to see if it, if it would be happy up here. Um, you know, I've got it covered in, in kind of like a little greenhouse, but it's still open enough where it'll get cold enough. Where is your shop? My shop is here. I'll type it. I'll type it in. It's uh, 1034 H Street in Arcata. What? What? Thirty four one zero three four. Yes. Oh, Arcata. Are people coming and buying cactus cacti? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I actually have a business partner. I'm the co-owner of the store, but I think we're gonna brainstorm on um, transitioning. I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> uh, back to the Christmas cacti. <clears throat> um, I have oh, yeah. one of the plants that probably needs to be transplanted because it started growing roots. Mm, okay, yeah. And is that telling me, please either give me more water or please transplant me? So, yeah, so those cacti are epiphytes. Um, so they grow on trees um, and they grow in very like humid environments. And, and Arcata, or yeah, I guess Arcata, but Humboldt too is, is kind of a humid environment. Um, I think those are called aerial roots. And um, a lot of plants do that when, uh, when they're in a humid environment. They'll just kind of like send roots out. Um, as far as potting and stuff like that, it really depends on how big your cactus is and how root bound it is in the pot. Um, I've got two different types of um, Ripsalis in my house and they've, they're both doing that as well. Um, but I just put them in new pots, so. Um, do you separate it out then when you repot or do you uh, just give it a bigger pot? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could do either or. I usually just, um, I kind of give it a little squish and kind of loosen it up a little bit. And then I, I give it a little bigger of a pot, but not too much bigger. But um, those cacti too, um, I have some friends that grow um, at the uh, Orchids for the People. And um, they, they grow a ton of those types of um, cacti or salads because they like that human environment. So they grow with orchids and stuff like that. But um, they grow in a coconut core with some pine bark and that's pretty much it, you know, so they don't even grow it in a, in a um, like a cactus mix. It's just, um, yeah, it's just like a really, it's, it's an organic uh, mixture. The, um, so what I should be doing when it, so, so the roots grow outside when it's humid, like during the summer, but during the winter, they don't tend to do that because indoor, because of the heat is drier. Is that how that mm. works? Yeah, I think so. No, I'm just trying to decide. It's a beautiful plant. And when it started growing all those roots, it's like, do I need to water it more? Or what is the problem? <laughs> yeah, I mean, those plants too, since they come from, they, they pretty much grow in tropical rainforests. And um, I keep mine pretty moist year round. 
Um, oh, do you? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. But I see a question here. There's a, is there a general way to know when a potted cactus needs water? Um, so yeah, it's dependent on the growing season. Um, I think, yeah, like I said, what was it? May through October. May through October is, is a, is a, is, you know, like it, they, they wake up from dormancy and, and once they wake up, you can kind of tell, um, sometimes they'll shoot up a flower or you can see some new growth on it. Um, if not, I still kind of water it a little bit just to get it, you know, cause maybe the water might wake it up a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I pretty much just wait until May through October to water anything. And, um, that's kind of like, you know, and then, and then, uh, if you're, if it's the growing season, um, just wait for the the moisture to be evaporated out of the pot before you keep watering it, or else you'll get root rot. Hey, wait, you have a question? I actually have a comment. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, Christmas cactuses or cacti, they are photoperiodic plants, which means they require short days of the fall season in order to initiate flowers. Same nice. is true about poinsettias, for example, or chrysanthemums are short day plants is what we call them. And then they're long day plants. And then most plants are day neutral. They're not photoperiodic, but uh, Christmas cacti are. And um, if you give them those short days of the fall season, then they will initiate flowers. That's why they call Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus, genus Schlumbergera. And uh, mm -hmm. if you ever see those uh, aerial roots on any plant, any tropical plant, if you see those aerial roots, they could turn into true roots. So if you cut them, cut the little branches that have those aerial roots and just stick them in the soil, they're going to go ahead and form true roots and they'll become like another, you can clone it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Is, is right. that how orchids work as well? Yeah, I mean. Because I have, I have roots growing out of my pot. You, you could, orchids require a lot of humidity and they're kind of, you know, very specialized flowers. Mm. So you have to have, in order to get them to flower again, you know, you need to have the humidity and the right amount of light. But you notice a lot of tropical plants like philodendrons or pothos, they form these aerial roots. It's a way to cling on to, you know, a branch or a mm -hmm. tree trunk. That's how they pull themselves up using those aerial roots. But then again, those aerial roots could turn into uh, true roots. Spider plant specifically, it has those little pups they have those aerial roots. So if you just snip off one of those pups and stick them in the soil, then in any kind of you know moist potting soil, they'll form two roots and you have a whole new plant. Great. I've got Cheap a way to get new plants. Yeah. The people got... that are stealing these should do that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> are there any other questions anybody has? Yes. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Kevin? Okay. Yes, yeah. um, I live on a hillside and uh, outside of town, and I I have quite a few uh, opuntias and trichocereus pachinois, mm -hmm. uh, pruvianus, and I've, I've I've gone through the ritual every winter of covering them uh, with plastic uh, tarps so that the so the roots don't get all wet and then a freeze comes along and they die. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to put them out on the hillside without having to go through the, the process and was told once by a fellow at the Arcata uh, market uh, that he does it in the hills in southern Humboldt at high elevation relatively and gets away with it. Mm -hmm. So well, guess what I'm wondering is what would I, I'm, I'm thinking because it's a hillside, uh, should I like dig out an area and line it with plastic and then put my soil down of rocks and uh, organic matter so that it will, the rain will not, uh, the roots won't find themselves in wet clay that is uh, holding on to the water. Um, any suggestions along that line? Yeah, I actually have this book on how to grow um, plants in this kind of an, an environment. Um, I wanted to do a lot of experimenting. I was going to try and um, give some plants away to, 
to some people to see how they would do. But um, as far as the uh, the Apuntias, um, I would, since it's on a hillside, uh, it shouldn't be a water, or it shouldn't be a problem with having like stagnant water. Um, but I would probably dig uh, a trench, um, fill it with, um, fill it with substrate. So I'd fill it with like rocks and sand and, um, and uh, like cactus soil, pumice like that. And um, I think that'd be fine. I've also seen Apuntias just growing uh, on hillsides like that as well um, without any you know, particular care. And I don't think that you need to put it in plastic. Yeah, I wouldn't put it in the plastic. Uh, the plastic, plastic is bad. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, I, well, I did. I wanted to avoid that. How about the Trichocerius? Trichocerius. Um, so I've got a friend in Blue Lake who grows them um, all along his house, but he keeps them underneath the awning, so um, they don't get you know bombarded with water. Um, but I have seen them here in in my neighborhood. Uh, People just have them growing in kind of like corn rows, you know, um, just out in the open. So that's kind of another thing too. Honestly, I'm a little, I'm new to the area. Um, I've only been here for a few years and um, I brought all my plants with me. So I've, I've been experimenting to see what I can and can't do here. Um, I wanted to get into landscaping, um, even though it sounds kind of funny. But um, yeah, so I would recommend just like, I'm not sure how many um, trichoceras you have, but I would just throw one out there and if it's not doing well you can always cut it and um put it in a different pot or something like that uh trying to get them out of pots actually i just want i oh, want okay. i want to get them on their own roots in the in on the hillside and uh like them to survive totally yeah that's yeah i would yeah i would just experiment with them um they should be a little adapted to this environment i'm sure if you've been keeping them outside like that um i'm sure they're used to the seasons and temperatures and stuff like that so well the the one real big uh kill i had was freeze uh during the winter after mm. after good rainfall mm. so the roots were wet and the plant above soil was getting frozen or living in a right. 32 temperature okay well that's my question mm. say experiment oh, okay <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't be more helpful. Any other questions or suggestions? If not, Ryan, thank you ever so much for sharing this with us and we'll look forward to coming to your shop. And I wanna let everybody know that next week, uh, Tracy Barnes Priestley is going to be giving a presentation on season two of what's on your bucket list which she's been doing on uh, Keat TV. And I hope you'll come and join us. That's a lot of fun. And, and we look forward to seeing you next week. In the meantime, enjoy the wonderful sunshine this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we hope to see you on, on Saturday at the uh, community center. Hmm? One o'clock, one to three, open house, February 11th. We have goodies. You get you get good snacks too, along with lots of good conversation with the with the instructors. So you get a chance to meet who you want to sign up with. <laughs> in fact, if you're still here, I will post a link to that information in the chat for your open house. So that's the link to open house. If you want to look more at our classes that are coming up in spring, the second link that I'm posting. That is our course catalog. If you have not received it in the mail yet, and you probably then, receive it sometime later this week. Here's hoping. Hopefully, hopefully before the open house, you'll have something to carry with you and walk around. But if not, you'll be able to talk to the instructors. You'll be able to register for classes on the spot, join all you get a membership. You can do all that stuff at open house. So we hope to see you then. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Good luck with your business. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. And the recording should be available Wednesday.